guys here with us. Uh, before I get started, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we are running a contest for a chance to win an all DE and one Mark II with a 12 to 40 Pro Lens. So if you haven't yet and you're interested, go um, find Amanda, find Jen, get your badge scan, they will help you out. But besides that, we are ready to introduce our next speaker, Joe Edelman. Joe is an award-winning photographer and educator based out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Joe is super well known for his very popular YouTube channel and he uses the YouTube channel to talk about the hows and whys of photography and to teach photographers how to pose, how to shoot, and he's really, really engaging. So we're super excited to have him here with us today. So without further ado, let me welcome Joe to the stage. Okay, all right. Thank you guys, thanks for coming out. How's everybody doing today? Having fun in Vegas, I hope, because it's kind of against the law here not to have fun, right? So listen, I am here to talk to you about fashion portraits because that's kind of what I'm most known for aside from the crazy stuff that I do on YouTube. But before I start, I have to give you a little bit of backstory as to how I wound up here. And that is that just three months ago, I switched to Olympus. So I am like the new guy on the block. So I'm only gonna say this word once. Please don't repeat it. I was a nighttime guy for like 42 years, which means I'm kind of old. But I did what everybody else did. When digital technology came around in the early 2000s, I chased megapixels. I chased bigger sensors. I chased more dynamic range. I chased bigger price tags, heavier cameras. And I got to a point where I realized that I was doing what a lot of you do. I took more pictures with this than I did with those really nice, expensive cameras that I had. I only picked those cameras up when it was work. I wasn't using my camera for fun anymore. Now, you know, I've been doing this a lot of years. The problem was not that I was bored with photography, it was just too much effort. So it wasn't like an overnight thing that I decided, hey, let's go change camera systems. After that many years, you don't do it that fast. It took me about a year and a half of kind of soul searching and researching to decide is this something that was viable for me? So I needed to make sure that I was gonna be able to replace all of the features, all of the needs that I was so accustomed to and do it with a brand new camera system. So I did a whole lot of research. I started looking at Micro Four Thirds and that was the last that I looked at because I thought that can't work and I was wrong. So I went out and I rented an Olympus camera, I tried it out and you know what? Step by step, it checked off all of the boxes for what I need. So now, I use Olympus's flagship camera. It's the OMD EM1 Mark II. It's a 24 megapixel camera. I've got a full lineup of the Enzuico lenses, which, by the way, don't take my word for it, try them out. These are some of the sharpest lenses you are ever gonna put on a camera. I am not exaggerating. So, Right on the other side of that wall there, Olympus has some models on a really cool steampunk set. So if you have a secure digital card, you can try out one of the cameras with the same lens that I use for most of these shots. Most of these shots were done with a 45 millimeter F1.2 Pro lens. One of them that went by was done with a 75 millimeter F1.8 lens. Both amazing lenses. So I'm not the guy to sell you on the cameras. All these folks in the gray shirts, they're the experts. So I did want to at least share with you my five favorite features about this camera. And the thing is, they're not all features that you might expect a portrait guy to be worried about. So first and foremost, they're small, which is what I wanted, but they're not too small. Ergonomically, these cameras are amazing. When you put one of these cameras in your hand, everything is where it needs to be. It just fits right and they are incredibly customizable. I've never seen a camera system with so many customizable function buttons so that you can really make the camera work the way that you like to work. Along with that, they are lightweight. That was a big one for me. I was tired of having to lug around all the really, really heavy equipment. Also, these are solid. You know, you think lightweight, you think small, you start thinking that, okay, it's gonna feel cheap. Not so. These cameras are solid metal bodies. Even the pro lenses have metal outsides, metal focusing rings. They have a really, really good quality feel to them. In addition to that, the 121 point dual fast autofocus. 
So follow along, this is as techy as I get, okay? There's two kinds of autofocus systems that are really popular amongst cameras today. Contrast detection and phase detection. And in the phase detection, they basically, in the focus points, put these little lines. Most camera systems use one line. Some it's horizontal, some it's vertical, some it's diagonal. Olympus has crosshairs in all 121 points. So what does it do for you who watches you care? It's super accurate and it's super fast. And you add to that the eye tracking continuous autofocus. I'm not telling, kidding you, it's to die for. It is crazy fast. Don't take my word for it. Pick up a camera, aim it at a model, and watch how quick that autofocus is. And if it's not set on eye focus when you get back there, ask one of the tech reps to set it on the eye tracking so you can see how fast it locks on. And here's one that most still photographers don't consider. I never considered it. It's the five axis image stabilization. So the sensor in the OMD EM1 Mark II, it floats, it's magnetized. So it's not locked in. So for a video, if you do shoot video, you can walk around with a camera and do a shot and it looks like it's on a gimbal. And I'm not exaggerating, it's incredibly smooth. But for still photographers, and this is cool. So I live in Pennsylvania where it's cold in the winter and I don't know about you, but I don't shoot outside in the cold. That's why I was never a landscape photographer. So I will definitely put this to use once the weather warms up. The five axis image stabilization, it gives you five extra shutter speeds that you can work with and get sharp images. So most photographers won't consider hand holding a picture below a 60th, maybe a 30th of a second, depending on the camera, depending on how steady you are, et cetera. Well now, drop down five more shutter speeds. And I didn't believe it. When I was learning about these cameras and reading about them, I went into the Facebook groups for Olympus and there were photographers posting landscapes and night shots that they handheld at a half a second. You know, coming from that other brand, I'm like, no way. That's just not happening. It works. It really, really works. So when you're working in difficult light situations, especially if you're worried about having to increase your ISO, this image stabilization gives you the option to go to a lower shutter speed if you don't have a fast moving object and keep a lower ISO to do your shots. So by all means, check those out, but that's not why you're here today. You're here to have me answer the question. What is a fashion portrait? And every time I talk about this, people are like, so what is a fashion portrait? Portraits, well, yeah, that's like a pictorial representation of a person. It could be to hang on a wall. It could be for a social media use. It could be for a corporate headshot. Heck, maybe it's for a dating app, right? That's why somebody gets a portrait done. So all of those kind of portraits, they kind of have rules. The picture's got to meet certain criteria in order to make it effective. I'm not a big fan of rules. If you follow me on YouTube, you know that. So what's cool about fashion portraits is I make the rules. I get to take a little bit from the portraiture world and a little bit from the fashion world and I kind of cram them together and see what I come up with. So let me give you an example. Here's a picture that I call a fashion portrait. This is a little bit more complicated and has a little bit more going on behind it. We've got really, really cool creative makeup that a very talented makeup artist did. In order to get the randomness in the picture, since the makeup and this girl's face are very symmetrical, I wanted to have some material blowing and floating around her head. So literally, I have a fan on the ground behind the model, and I am both managing the material and I'm shooting with a wireless remote control. My makeup artist is behind the camera giving the model directions so that she's keeping her head straight, keeping her face into the camera lens, and you can see when the shot was done, the young girl was quite relieved because the fan was really cold. So now, that's really cool, but I don't want to scare you away from this idea and thinking, ah, oh, you know what, I don't have all that kind of crazy equipment, and I've never done that much stuff. Fashion portraits can be really simple, too. So to give you an example, here's the same young model in a very nice, pretty headshot. But by making some really simple changes and using the exact same lighting, I can turn this into a fashion portrait. If I simply slick her hair back, give her a pair of sunglasses, and when I shoot in the studio, I'm not using them here today so that I don't have to trip over the cords, but in my studio, I shoot with the Interfit Honey Badgers. They are hands down my studio strobe of choice. I love them for tons of reasons of which you can learn about on my YouTube channel. So what I've done here is I've centered the 24 inch pop-up softbox from Interfit in the sunglasses and made my fashion shot. Now, I believe in never stopping when I think I'm done. 
because there's always something more to be found. So I decided, hey, this is really cool, very dramatic, but I want to go with a little bit more drama. And I'm also kind of lazy. I wanted to do it without having to set up all new lighting and change stuff around. So all I did, I raised the light and the softbox higher. I went to a lower camera angle and I had the young girl look up to the softbox so that I'm looking up at her and it gives me a more dramatic feel. So let's go ahead and let's jump in and let's see if we can kind of create some pictures for you guys. Shayla, can I get you to come on up? Here we go. I have a beautiful young model here named Shayla. Where did my spot go? There you go. I'm going to put you right there, Shayla. Okay? So I'm not the guy that's going to razzle-dazzle you and show you this amazing stuff. I want to walk you through the process. Okay? So instead of spending a whole bunch of time making a picture perfect, I want to show you the steps and share with you my thought process of how I'm going to go ahead and build a shot. And we have a kind of unusual shooting space in that I don't have a flat background that's you know, parallel to where I'm going to be shooting. It's angled, but I can use that as a background. And again, if you've ever watched my videos, you know that my favorite background color, if I could only have one background to use ever, it would be gray. And the reason being with gels, I can turn that gray into any color that I want to, okay? So for today, just to keep things lightweight and fast, I am using these Godox or Flashpoint, depending on where you buy them. They're called 8200s. They're a pocket flash, which means they're kind of a hybrid. They are a cross between a speed light, because they kind of look like a speed light, and also a studio strobe, because, in part because they recycle as fast as what a studio strobe does. And they work on lithium batteries. Uh, I'm shooting tethered so that you can see what comes up as I shoot. And I'm going to start just with one light. And what I did is I've got a little simple reflector on here so you can see what we've got there. It's slightly diffused. Now, if you've ever done any lighting work at all with models or with people, you should be anticipating this is going to be fairly harsh, strong light. Probably not the most flattering thing in the world. And all good photography is about problem solving. So right before I came on here, for whatever reason, my trusty Seconic flash meter died. So we're gonna do it old school, okay? So I've got this strobe set at about 1 16th power. So I'm gonna let you see everything here. I'm not gonna hide any of it. I'm just gonna go ahead and do one quick test shot. And indeed, it is overexposed. You should see it pop up here momentarily. Guys, it's okay to put that up, yep. I'll show them the good stuff and the bad stuff. So I'm gonna turn this down about two stops and we're gonna go again. All right, so we're, we're in the ballpark here. So now, if we just kind of look at this, it's dramatic, not the most flattering thing in the world, but you saw the kind of pictures I do. I gotta have a whole lot more going on than that. So I'm gonna do two things here. One is I'm gonna bring this light a little bit closer and let's, uh, let's get some of our cool props back here. Since I did the sunglasses in the little intro, let's do those really quick to show you how that works. I'm gonna give Shayla these sunglasses to work with. And she's done this one a couple times, so she already knows she's gonna look up towards the light. Now in the past, here at WPPI and in that video clip, I did them with a softbox. This time it's just the small diffuser. So we're gonna go and we're gonna see if we can get kind of a big bright spotlight in the middle there. There we go. And then what we want to do is we want to play around with that. Look up there again a little bit more and I want to see if I can get it centered just a bit better. We'll go one more and we're getting close. So if I was going to shoot this all the way through, my goal would be to get those two dots kind of centered in the glasses. But for me, it still needs some more. Okay. So this is where I'm going to go to a second light. For the second light, I'm going to set behind her to light this wall. Now, we can go, oops, let's turn that on. They always work better when you turn them on for some reason. I, I don't know. All right. Just from having done this a bunch of times, usually if I throw a light back there, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set it up at full power and let it just go and see what it gives me. Why? Just to see what it gives me. I have an idea of where I want to go with this, but every now and then I'm surprised. The last time I did this talk this morning, I did a shot 
with some aluminum foil and I intended to do it on a white background and just by chance the flash didn't fire and the black background looked 10 times cooler than what I had in my head. So we went down that path with the black background, okay? So now we're gonna try the same thing, good. Nice, all right. So there we've got the hot white background, okay? Very dramatic. The reason why I went with this small modifier first and I want to teach you a little lesson, and this is a, this is a bad word to so many people. So please don't leave when I say it. Actually, it's a phrase, okay? When you want to learn lighting, lighting doesn't have to be difficult, but when you want to get good at lighting, you have to learn about the inverse square law, period. It's not really an option if you want to get really good at lighting. So the short version is the inverse square law says that the closer your subject is to your light source, the faster the exposure falls off. The further away the, ex the subject is from your light source, the longer it takes for the exposure to fall off. So you can see in that shot, the shadows along the camera right side of her face are kind of very sharp and they're defined, right? So just to show you the difference from modifiers, because this is a very kind of small light source that we're using at the moment, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put a speed light head on top of this flash. And I'll use a modifier. And again, just to keep it simple, we are gonna go with a simple shoot through umbrella. Now, if you haven't done a lot of lighting before, if you're thinking about getting into lighting and you wanna learn it, this should be your best friend to start. It's not as cool and sexy as some of the modifiers that you're gonna see around the hall. So like if anybody from one of those companies comes after me, I need you to protect me, okay? But you can buy one of these for less than 20 bucks. My favorite one happens to be the PhotoFlex one, okay? You can use it as a regular umbrella and reflect light this way because it's satin, or you can shoot light through it to get it a little bit softer. So for the sake of this shot, let's go ahead and do two versions real quick. So you're gonna see kind of three different setups with the umbrella and how it changes the light. Okay, now this will also change our exposure slightly. So go ahead and that's a good, Shayla, awesome. So yeah, I'm a little darker. So now you can see, and I'm gonna let you see these. So that's knocking out probably a stop and a half to two stops of light. Why? Umbrellas are not the most efficient light source because it's throwing light everywhere, but it's easy okay and you can already see that hard line from the shadow is not there so if i adjust my exposure let's go down about a stop and a half here we'll start there and i'm going to go one more we'll go to there so now is another one going to pop up now you see how soft that is in fact now we're getting soft enough my background's almost getting a little too bright and i should dial that down but you see the difference that that modifier creates on the light in the face and then we can take this same light if we want to, and we can spin it around one more time. I'm gonna back it up a little bit. And now we're going to use it as a shoot through umbrella. Okay. So the point is umbrellas have lots of versatility. And I'll give you a little tip. I mentioned beauty dishes before. With a little bit of practice, if you put this close enough to your subject, you can create the exact same kind of light that you get from a beauty dish with an umbrella. If you don't believe me, try it or check out the video on YouTube, okay? So let's try another one here. And again, we'll see what our exposure is and make some adjustments. Oops, sorry, here we go. I want you guys to be able to see it. Good. So now we're in the middle. We have a more rapid light fall off, but still not a hard line just by switching the modifiers around. So the trick is when you get these modifiers, I don't care what you get, if it's a softbox and umbrella, you need to experiment with them, you need to play with them. Don't just think, oh, you can only use it one way. But for me, since I already did that other picture that you saw, I'm bored with this whole white thing. I wanna make it a little bit more interesting and I wanna get some color into it. So sadly, I'm old enough that I remember the 70s, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna add some color here. She won't admit it, but this is her favorite one, okay? So we're gonna wrap this around. That's it, good, really good. Tuck that in. 
Awesome. Now, that white background, that'll be a little bit too much. So I think we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a blue background for this. So I'm just going to pop a blue filter over that. And let's see where we're at here. So the variable now, I haven't changed anything here. So I know I've already got my exposure on her face kind of dialed in. The variable is going to be where am I at with the blue filter? I didn't change the exposure set or the power setting in the flash, but I added a filter in. So I'm going to chin up just a little bit. Good. Cool. Okay. And then we get our blue. So we've got the green, we've got the blue. We're starting to add a little bit more drama to it. And again, if we're doing it for real, we're going to experiment a little bit with getting those reflections centered in the glasses. And I'm not going to do it this time because I want to play with some other tricks. But I'll give you one more little tip for this idea with the blue gels. As much as I love the gray, people overlook the idea that you can change the color of a black background. So if I were to roll that black background down, put the blue gel in front of that, I'd have to turn the power up a little bit. I'll get a blue glow, but it fades to black and it fades much faster. So it becomes really dramatic. And if you were watching in the pictures that went by in the beginning, that's the way that I did the one that went by in the beginning. It was actually a black background with the blue gel. Okay? All right, so I am going to take these pieces from Shayla. Whoop, why wait? Oh, it's in your hair. There we go. Sorry, dear. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. So while we have these lights here, and while I have the light in the background, I had an idea before I came to WPPI, and I thought, this is going to be one of my dumbest ideas ever. And for whatever reason, people seem to like this idea. So we're going to do it again, OK? How many of you cook while you shoot? Or better yet, are you into sci-fi? My wife's really into sci-fi. I can't stand sci-fi. So I'm going to take some aluminum foil. I'm going to roll out a nice, big, long piece here. And the whole point behind this is just to show you that sometimes the least obvious things are the best things. You just got to play with them and see what you come up with. So keep in mind that most aluminum foil has two different sides. One's the really shiny side. One is kind of the dull matte side. I'm not kidding when I say I don't like working any harder than necessary, so I will work with the dull side. I don't want to make my life any more difficult than it needs to be, OK? So. I'm going to crumple this up a little bit because I want texture. I want it to kind of be sending light in all different directions. And once we have this kind of crumpled up, all right, now what you have to do, you got to dig deep, really deep. You got to find your inner fashion designer because you know you've always wanted to try it, right? So I'm going to take this and I am going to create a very futuristic collar right down here, like so. And ooh, this is actually kind of cool. This is different than the way we did it before, and different is fun. So now, let's just take a test shot. I took the blue gel off, still have the same light here, and I want to see where I'm at. Now, I can already see one thing I want to change, but let's do the test shot, and then I'll tell you what that change is, OK? Right here at me. You know, somebody somewhere along the line had this really bad idea, at least bad for guys like me. They decided that models should be tall. I don't know whose idea that was. So here we go. That's it. Nice. All right. So well, this is kind of cool, but it's still, it's still missing some stuff. So I think what I want to do here, we need to, we need to dress it up a little bit because I want to do, I want to do classy sci-fi. I think that's what we need. It's got to, it's got to be classy. So. Let's see where, did I lose my little collar piece? Uh-oh. All right, I have another one. We'll do something different, OK? By the way, fabric stores are your best friend if you do this kind of photography. Go to the clearance aisles, buy little bits, pieces, leftover stuff, anything you can find. And it's great. I have a lot of fun with it. You know why? If you've never been to a fabric store, 
It's always little old ladies that work there. So I come up to the counter with all these crazy materials, and I look at my watch, and it's like, how long is it gonna take before they're finally cutting the material and looking at me and saying, okay, what are you gonna make? Like, every time, okay? And then I have to explain that I'm not really making anything, so uh, let's see, let's get a clamp. All right, so I'm gonna remove this. I've gotta be very careful with that now because now it is officially a fashion piece. And I'm going to go ahead and create a little collar here by taking this trim. It's just trim that you can find in a fabric store. And since I'm not gonna see it all, I'm not worried about how great it looks back here, I'm actually gonna clip it to her ponytail. There he goes that, okay, good. And yeah, that'd be cool. Now we're going to reattach. So remember, when New York Fashion Week comes up, you saw it here first, okay? So, all right, and same light. I'm still not gonna change the light. I'm gonna work with this. And right here, Shayla, awesome. Now, just a tiny little bit. I wanna turn that face, not your shoulders, just your face, and a little tilt. That's it, good, good, good. And right here, good. Let's come a little closer, same thing. Awesome, now. I'm kind of liking that, but if I'm shooting a shot like this, what's one of the first things I told you? Work your shot, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna try some different variations here. Bring your eyes right out past here, right there. Let's see, what happens if we get that spotlight in the background? Probably nothing, but we'll try it. Yeah, that's not a good one. Okay, there we go. And now keep the head right there. Just bring the eyes right to this edge of the lens. Good, nice. Okay, see how many different options and variations? Some of you like one, some of you like another, there's nothing that's particularly wrong. So I said earlier today that when I was trying one of them, suddenly the black background turned out a lot better. So I'm gonna turn that off. There, you'll be able to see it's not firing. This was the one that I tried and the black kind of looked cool. So let's uh, back up here. There we go. And if you like more drama, there's more drama. And it does, especially with that collar. It almost looks a little bit more elegant, right? But there's the lessons. Number one, just by switching out that background, the picture has a whole different feel. It kind of speaks to you differently. The most important thing for you to understand when you start trying this stuff, there is no right or wrong. Right or wrong is defined by what do you like. And most importantly, I shoot mostly women. I live in fear of ever making a woman look bad, ever. So they're really important, okay? It's your client and you in terms of deciding how's the shot look, all right? So I wanna go ahead and try one more kind of crazy thing here. And yep, look at that, okay, good, good. Okay. So I'm gonna need an assistant if I could have, Tracy, do you mind? Cool. All right, so Shayla, I'm gonna let you sit right here on that, okay? I'm gonna ask you to spray a water bottle for me in a second here, okay? So let's back this up. Oh, it's not gonna be on her. So, so it's, <laughs> she's like, huh? Okay, so there we go. All right, so I'm just gonna do a test shot first and then I'll get you the water, okay? All right, so, one of the things when you're working in a studio, I learned this early on in, in my career, when I started to get into this stuff, I started getting bored with my backgrounds. And you know, backgrounds cost money. Even if you're buying the paper ones, that still costs money. And you could start adding filters and adding gels, but you kind of run out of stuff to do. So part of your task as a photographer is to think outside the box and experiment and play with ideas. So what I'm gonna do for this shot now I have her sitting, so I'm gonna bring the lights a little bit lower, but we're gonna keep it the same, because I wasn't kidding when I said I'm lazy. I'm not gonna make my work any harder than it needs to be, okay? So I'm gonna bring that down. 
You'll notice I have that light, it's now facing at the back of her head. So if I had my hairstylist out here, I could take a few minutes and we could tease her hair out and it would light the hair up, just like the picture that you saw in the beginning. But we're not gonna go that route. So let me do a quick test, see where we get with it. Okay, that's gonna be crazy enough. So now, it's amazing how much stuff is in the air here. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's dial that down just a little, okay? Because I was gonna put stuff in the air, but I almost don't have to. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give our Olympus visionaries, this is what happens when you become a visionary, we put them to work, literally, okay? <laughs> so you're just gonna kind of spray across their steady stream, okay, when I say go. So one of the ways that you can kind of add to your backgrounds and mix things up is find things that you can put between your subject and your background that creates depth. So one of the easiest ones to do, you saw Sean and Danielle using hairspray for their brides, okay? It probably would not be a good idea if they walked into somebody's house and started spraying a water bottle around. So the hairspray is great, but I'm gonna use water. So Tracy, if you can spray. Nice, okay, cool. No, you're doing great, you're doing great. Good. So you see the idea? And if we play with that for a little bit, and then hopefully I don't need to state the obvious, if we put a gel on it, we can make it even more dramatic yet. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn it down just a tiny bit more. All right, Tracy, one more time. Here we go. Good. Now, just a little bit, turn your face, come up to here, a little tilt. I don't want you to look right out here past my fingers. Good. Okay, here we go, Tracy. Thank you. That's it. Awesome. You were great, Tracy. Thank you. Round of applause for Tracy, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so here you go. Here's the ones I was waiting for coming up at the end. As soon as that renders, summary, all right? Have fun. Play around with stuff. I'm pretty confident none of you ever thought about wrapping somebody in aluminum foil for a picture, at least not for artistic reasons, right? So experiment with things. Play with color. Color is a lot of fun. And understand that color has emotion. You saw how the emotion changed just from going to the white background to the black background on that previous shot with the aluminum foil. There's so much that you can do. Just think outside the box. Don't worry if it's right, if it's wrong, play around with it. And importantly, work your shot. Don't be lazy. Don't pick up the camera, take one or two frames, and then think you've got it and you're done. Play around and see what happens. If I was gonna shoot this shot in my studio for real, like this was my intended idea, work with the water, work with the color, just to give you a benchmark, I would probably wind up shooting between 350 to 500 frames to get the one shot. Now, they're not all gonna be the same. Why would it be changing? Why would I need that many? I would be changing my camera angles. I would be changing her pose. You noticed when I first did it, since I was being lazy, when she was looking at me, I didn't have anything going on in the eyes because they were in shadow. That's when I had her tilt her head and lift up so that I brought her face to the light. I would experiment with the water in the background. I would experiment with the intensity of it. All of those are gonna lead me down the path to finding the image that is finally gonna kind of grab me by the ears and not let me look away and say, that's it. So. Make sure that you guys hang around. Tracy is actually gonna be coming up to talk next. She, and if you like to see action stuff with long flowing chiffon, she does some really cool action maternity shots. And we've got Sean and Danielle King going back later today to do uh, some really, really cool stuff with brides and grooms. Thank you for coming out to see me. If you haven't seen me on YouTube, you don't know about this, but if you have seen me on YouTube, you know how I finish my videos. Please get out there when you leave WPPI, Pick up the cameras, use them, practice, experiment, because your best shot, it's your next shot, gang. Thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Shayla, thank you.